Are you here today? I had her down as a reader, but okay. No, all right. I'll probably read it then. Okay. Um, and the second thing, your worship guide. If you could take that out and a pen. Uh, this is not something I normally do. Um, I'm going to break that because otherwise I'll poke my eye out, just like they say in Christmas story. Um, so on your worship guide, is a place to take notes. I'm going to ask you to do something for just a little bit. 60 seconds. So if you don't have notes, you have to do it in your mind. It's better, better if you write it down. I want you to write down who you are. When you think of yourself, when I think of Jeff Dryden, I think of, right, right, just don't evaluate it, just write it down, 60 seconds. You only have 55 seconds now. It's an old youth pastor thing. What do you think of when you think of yourself? Who is Jeff Dryden? Who am I? Thirty seconds. Okay, stop. Okay, I want you to pass all your papers to the middle. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's just for you. Uh, yeah, put your names out of yeah. <laughs> put your name on someone else's. It'd be better. Okay, we're gonna pick that up later on. Um, and I forgot. I'm just watching you write those things down. Oh man, do I love you guys. And thank you, thank you for the last few days, early in the week and last weekend, the way in which you served in this place, the pastors and wives that came here, they were filled up and blessed, okay? I, we, we heard stuff again and again and again. So Gary Chapman, how many of you ever read Five Love Languages? Okay, so true confession. So I'm basically one, nearly one of the least likely guys to be a pastor because I got so much pride and arrogance in me. I, like Gary, Gary Chapman, it's a good book. Like I, I sped read it. I didn't read the whole thing. But anything gets marketed by five love languages and you know, whatever. You know, when people market stuff, I'm, like, I'm not reading that because he's got all these books out. It was really good. He was way more personable, way better. I mean, he, he was one, he's a teacher. It was so good. And then you guys serving the prayer times we had here Tuesday night, they were blessed by your hospitality, blessed by the hotels here. So thank you. And I, I hope, hope it was a little bit of the Lord that came through to this, this city. So thank you um, for the way you did that. And Dave and Peg, you guys that kind of led up a prayer team and other guys up in Sawyer, thank you. That was, that was wonderful. Okay, so here we are in John 15. Um, when Mike and Rob and I meet, um, we try to get together on Friday afternoons and talk about the text for about 10 days ahead and just talk about, hey, what's the main things going on here? And sometimes we try to boil it down into a main idea. So here's the one I have for today. Um, I'm not necessarily happy with it, but that's right. That a relationship with Christ keeps you always connected to him. What he's going to talk about today. But he says so much in here, I had to add a second thing. This would be a sub point, but it's pretty strong on this text. Because he'll talk about fruit. That love and obedience are fruits of abiding in him. Or you could substitute that word. Love and obedience are fruits of being connected to him. So we're going to read this. And, and what, I, what I'm trying to do, I just want to unpack this. So probably many of us are familiar with this at some point. But I, I, I want to receive this. And, and honestly, this week of studying this, there's some ways this impacted me differently than it ever has before. And I, I long for that for us. So, John 15, verses 1 to 17. Oh, you got it? Excellent, thank you. I had the wrong person written down. Thank you, Mark. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I abide in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, 
thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Mm -hmm. This is my commandment, that you do love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has none than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know his master, what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For that I have heard from my Father that I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should abide, so that whenever you ask in my Father's name, he may give it to you. These things I command to you, so that you will love one another. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we know this is your very word. It's breathed out from you. So whether we've heard this scripture many, many times or whether this is new to us, it doesn't matter. We want to receive it as you intend. So help that happen today, God. That's what your Holy Spirit does. Whether we think we know it or not. We know that part of this gospel, part of the reason that this is written is so that we would actually believe who Jesus is and that by believing we'd have life in Jesus. Lord, we, we are not interested in religion. We are interested in you. Because you've done that in us. You, you're the one that's awakened us to your reality. And Lord, this week for many of us, it's been a hard week. We look ahead. It looks hard there too. We need you and we want to walk with you. So teach us even using your word today. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I, I'll ask, I've asked it for a couple weeks. How many of you have read this text today? Okay, okay, not bad. Not bad. Let's, let's make it more next week. And I ask that sometimes, Why? Oh, so you can raise your hand. I think you're cool. No, I raise it because the message is in the text. And, I, and so a couple things. I, I want you, whatever I say here, it means nothing if it's not here in the text. So I want you to read it. And when you read it ahead, it prepares you to receive from God. So whenever Mike or I are preaching, I mean, I don't know, we probably read this thing 20, 25 times. I keep learning. The Holy Spirit keeps showing me things. So that's what we want to do. And I like this being somewhat interactive. Sure, I've prepared but I will sometimes ask questions because I want to engage you. Spiritual growth is the thing we're engaged with the Holy Spirit. When we come on a Sunday morning, when we come, we are looking for the Lord. It's not like this little thing we do to get like a little spiritual chip. We, we need God, so I want to be engaged with that. Okay, so this is not my notes. I'm going to ask it anyway. And I didn't tell you I was going to ask it. What was the word that was used many times? Anybody got a guess? What's a word you noticed that was used a lot? There's actually a few of them, but Abide. Okay, abides used a lot. Got to guess how many times? Over or under five? Over? Under. Over. Over, under 10. Over, under. Oh, a little not sure. Barely over. Ten, 11. Okay, so it's used. So when there's some, it's used a lot. And actually, it's used a lot here, but we don't see it in other places in John. So it's important in terms of what he's saying here. So we need to figure that word out. What does he mean by that? And pay attention to it. So all I'm doing here, I'm, we're kind of, Talk about how do you read the Bible? How do you understand it? Here's, there's a message here. So here's what we're going we're gonna to consider some questions today. What does it mean to abide? What exactly is bearing fruit? I didn't write down, but he said that a lot, didn't he? Talk about fruit, fruit bearing. Why does he use this, this um, illustration or word picture of a vine and branches? So I did bring this in here. Um, I don't have it. So on the other campus, I actually pulled it out of the back. So it's kind of a surprise. I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to do it here. So I just put it up here last night. So there's, but there's something. Why does he use that illustration? There's something about that. It's the only place he does this. And it's an illustration he's using right before he leaves. So let's pay attention. Let's, what is that? So I did put up a little outline for some of you people that like outlines. This is not Jesus outline, but it's kind of the flow so verses one and two, he's, he's kind of saying this word picture that I'm the vine, life comes from abiding in me. He makes really clear in verses three through eight, you need to remain in me, or he can use the word, you need to abide in me. 
And then he goes on and kind of ex- explains that further from the text. But it's, it's a little bit cyclical, but that's how that is. All right, let's start with the first one. Jesus is divine. Life comes from abiding in him. So what's that mean? Let me read one and two again. I'm the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch of mine that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So I brought this out here. I said that kind of the the main idea is that a relationship with Christ keeps us always connected to him. So this is the metaphor that Jesus is using right as he is preparing to what? To leave on the vine. You're the branches. And I'm not going to be with you, next to you, pretty soon. Yet I'll be with you. We've seen these in the last weeks. He talked about his spirit. I will be with you. I'm not abandoning you as orphans. He's using this word picture to teach them something about his presence. And when he says that to them, it's to us. He's the vine We are the branches. We must remain connected to him. There is absolutely no life for us if we become disconnected from our vine. The vine is the source. I don't know. I I had a couple of these. I don't know if you can tell that much. This thing was super long. Like, actually, I think I trimmed this a couple times. So it was probably three times as long as this. Um, You can kind of tell this is the part where the green part is. Um, I had to come up, cut out, oh, there's a green one. I had to cut it because it, it went like way out here. I couldn't fit it in my car, basically. Um, and so you could see this part being the vine. It's interesting, up here, where the branches get kind of thick, and it's almost like you can't tell which is vine and branch at a certain point. So that vine goes on. There's this being intertwined, being interconnected, but it's very clear that the branch disconnected from the vine, there's no life. The, the, the branch gets its source of life from being connected to the vine. So he's saying that about life in him. That to have life, we must be, it's inseparable, we must be intertwined with him. So think how different that is from religion. Religion. It's not religion. Religion is more like a hobby. It's more like a compartment of your life. I go and do this. You know, I go and read my Bible. I go, I go to church. And that's, that's how people view religion. You know, or, or religion essentially is this, I do things for God. It's not what he's talking about. Now, coming to church is important, but that's not the reason to go to church. I mean, we come here because there's a life in him. We, there's, there's something that happens in his activity together here. But I don't go here because then God views me differently. That, that's religion. And, and people have been religious in all kinds of systems and all kinds of places for generations. That's not what Jesus is talking about. That is not the gospel. He wants us to have a life in him. And so here in this church, we talk about that life in him together. You know, that, that converge, converge together. At the cross, we're the same, but the life is found in him together. So it's not a hobby. It's not a compartment of our life. What Jesus is describing here is he intends to be our life so that our lives are actually intertwined with him like branch and vine. Okay, so when we read this, what's the, what's the purpose of the branch? What's supposed to happen from the branch? What's the branch supposed to do? It's supposed to, it's supposed to bear fruit. That's... The idea. And if there's no fruit in the branch, what happens? What did he say? Gets cut off. Gets thrown into a pile. It withers. Thrown into a pile. It gets burnt up. That's what happens. What, what happens to the branch that does bear fruit? Well, God, the vine dresser goes like, cool, my branch is bearing fruit. And he goes and puts a ribbon on it, right? Throws a party. Look at my branch. Look at all the fruit. Is that what he says? And what's he say? Prunes it. Think about that. He prunes it. Now I'm going to pause for a second before I talk about pruning, but I do want to say this. That he actually says when the, the branch bears fruit, actually it makes God happy. I think it's verse 8. We're talking about there's glory to God when that happens. He actually talks about how, how there's, Jesus has joy and how our joy is full in terms of there being fruit. But 
he says here in verse 2 that the branch that bears fruit, he prunes. He takes it. If I was going to do this right, just to show this is actually not a plastic one, I actually got to get it in there. Yeah, get it in there, buddy. Take a branch that's easier to get. Okay. He cuts it. He prunes it. And it almost doesn't make sense because this thing's sharp. That seems like that would hurt, doesn't it? I mean, like, if you cut off my finger, ah, it hurts. It doesn't grow back. You cut off a shoelace. You made your shoelace shorter. That's not helpful. How is how's pruning good? I mean, he describes that as something that he does. And so we understand this in agriculture that in pruning, how many of you are gardeners or do pruning? Okay. So not a third, but it's necessary to grow, to become stronger. It's a principle of botany. So I don't know if you've ever seen something get pruned down. My, my wife and I have these little discussions. She's got these... Um, is it dune grass? Is that what we call them? So I remember when we, we got this dune grass, and it looks awesome in our area, but that stuff, I mean, the first, she, she trimmed that way, paper down, so it looked like dune stubble, is what it was. You gotta do that so this thing grows, and it did, and it grew like a bush. It had to be trimmed down. I mean, I don't understand that, like finger and shoelace, but in botany, the, the thing that Jesus is talking about, it actually grows, it gets stronger. I, um, in a different life, I worked for a lawn care company, and we had an arborist, we'd go out, and we'd go out in the wintertime and actually prune um, grapevines. And I remember he would prune those things down so much. You look like he killed them. They look like they're dead. I remember one customer called up and said, I'm suing you guys. You killed my vine. He goes, nope, just wait till spring. Just wait till spring. The guy calls back later in the summer apologizing because he had the best crop he'd ever had. Pruning seems like when you look at it, it doesn't make sense, does it? You it doesn't make sense on your finger. It doesn't make sense on your shoelace. Why does it make sense here? It's the illustration Jesus is using. The branch that bears fruit, I prune. It looks like this is a thing that's going to hurt. And what's he talking about? He's talking about a life in him. Isn't he? he he's talking about where life comes from in terms of Jesus to teach us that we must get pruned in order to bear fruit. And I, I know this in my own life. The times when there's actually been spiritual growth, spiritual growth comes out of time of challenge, of difficulty, of struggle. Like it feels like pruning. How about this phrase? Trust God. Have faith in God. How do you just have faith in God? How do you just trust God? How do you? What I find in my life is God brings circumstance. He brings the things to me to make me trust him. I got nowhere else to turn. I don't know what else to do. That's when it grows. It's a pruning. That, thing, that thing's going on. You're like, what do I do? It's actually God pruning. It's actually kind that he does. It's actually good where that takes place. But, I, but when it's happening, I don't know. What does it say in John? In James? Consider it all joy, brothers when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Actually, that word steadfastness or endurance is closely related to that word abide in some ways. And it's got some similar overtones there. So know this, that's what God does for those that are his when they're abiding. That's the beginning analogy. So verses three through eight then. He speaks of how the disciples must remain in him, and he uses this word abide. It's, it's a really rich word. I'm, I think everybody here's, I think at the same, do we all have English Standard Version? Does anybody have a different version of the Bible? Anybody? Okay. Because it can be, get, be translated different ways. Uh, the word abide is sometimes translated to remain, to stay, to continue, to dwell in. Um, it can be translated to persevere or endure. Okay. 
So here's why I started in the beginning with writing down how you see yourself. Who's Jeff Dryden? It's a sense of, it's, it's, a, it's kind of thinking quickly about our identity. What are the things that describe me? Do you see yourself fundamentally, do you see yourself always as connected to Christ? When he's speaking of abiding in him, he, he wants us to understand things that way so that we are so connected to him that any point even all points of the day, we're aware of him. That's probably not true for any of us yet. But it grows that at any point in the day, you're aware of him. Or all points of the day, you are aware of him. This abiding in him and have a life in him is aiming in those kinds of things. So I just ask this for you. Do you see that growing in your life? Or do you wish for it to grow? Are you asking God for that? Because a life in him is those kinds of things. An awareness of his presence. Now I'll get confessional when we get near the end. I'll tell you how many times I don't act like that. But right now we're just calling it out. That, when he's describing it, that's what it is. Do you desire a growing awareness of his presence? So think about your last week. You can probably about think, think about times when you weren't. Times when you wished you were. But that's the connectedness to him. That's why I did identity. That this, this sense of belonging to him, I'm, I'm always or continually, or growingly aware of that. So, what does it mean to abide? What does it mean to abide? I mean, Jesus doesn't specifically answer that question. We don't, I love it when Peter, one of the guys, asked the question. Nobody asked this one, so we don't know specifically, but I think he gives us some clues. Uh, let, me, let me be a little bit, let's be interactive. So, he talks about abiding in him. Does he talk about any, abiding in anything else? Anybody else see that anywhere? Oh, you didn't tell me to look at my Bible. I know. Anything, any place else, anything? Any guess is fine, by the way, but as long as it's in the text. What's that? Abide in his love? Keeping his commandments? Did I hear another one? Continuing his word, abiding his word. Okay. So I want to, he actually t- uses that word abide in his word abiding in his love or having his words abide in you so look at um so verse seven if you abide in me and my words abide in you ask anything you want and then he says um the keeping of his commandments interesting how that's connected verses nine or ten to abiding in his love and um jesus actually says that's what i do too i abide in my father's love so he's calling us to do what he actually does And I'm not going to take this out long, but when you read this, chapters 13 through 17, here's an interesting parallel. Jesus continually talks about the interrelationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I think it was last week where he said, I am in the Father and you are in me and the Father is in you. Or Or his prayer. So the Trinitarian, the way Father, Son, and Spirit relate are connected, are united, and always one. He parallels that for our relationship with him. He calls us to that same thing. Just as I abide in my Father's love, I want you to abide in my love. It's an interesting thing to think about in terms of being inseparable. This is so much to be part of us. This is not religion. This is not a thing we do. It's a thing that God's, he's making us become. This is, this is true transformational change. It actually happens in us. It's happening in us actually does it's really good and he's he's calling us to that so what i want to do next is unpack what does it mean to have his words abide in us and then to abide in his love so have any of you ever done scripture memory tried to memorize verses at all some okay so i'm going to do a good and bad on that okay um when i was a kid i was involved in some pro well, my parents so my parents, nobody in their family ever went to church. They were the first Christians in their family. I was a little kid. I remember it happened. I remember the change of my dad. So I was pretty little, and we started going to church. And I remember going to church programs, and they wanted to teach you to memorize scripture. That's a really good thing. But here's what I remember as a kid. Um, when I memorized the verse, I got candy. Thank you. Finally, someone said, I got candy. That's good. What do you think I was thinking about as a kid? I want to get candy. I know how to get candy. 
So I'm the firstborn, so firstborn, here's the goal, go get the goal. Go get the goal faster than anybody else, you get there. So I memorized lots of verses, I got lots of candy. Went to the dentist. It was good. So it, I had the word in me, but I don't know if the word was taken over. And I'm not saying that's bad, I'm just saying you want to get the heart of a thing, okay? And as a kid, I didn't get the heart of the thing. And actually, sometimes I'd recall a verse in a, in a, in a less mature way. So let me describe it. Differently, and I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying, I'm describing me. Later on, um, in college, at a certain point, I went to Illinois State University, which was not known as like the mecca of uh, spiritual transformation or anything. It wasn't. It was a fairly intense environment, and um, I was involved in this this campus fellowship. It was a really great time of growing, but I remember. Getting up, I have no idea why I took an eight o'clock class. And an eight o'clock class, walking across campus is a half hour walk. And I remember um, starting scripture memory. I think it was a program by InterVarsity, it might have been NAVS, but memorizing scripture. So in a half hour walk, I'd have these couple little verse cards and I'd memorize stuff. But I needed it. Getting no candy. There's no like turning in my, hey, I, I did this, this. I needed it. And so in, in memorizing and walking across campus, I was thinking about the verse, not just trying to get the words down. And it had an effect on me. So here's what I think. This is my best understanding of, of, of abiding in his word. It does include memorizing, but I, I remember his word. I remember it. I think about it. And it affects me. How do I abide in Christ? One part is abiding his word. I think about it, so memorize it. Or I, no, I'm sorry, I remember it. I think about it. I have it affect me. I think that's, that's my understanding of that. Similarly, how do we understand abiding in his love? I would say those, I would use those same three verbs in, in a sense. I remember it. I am aware of his love which may be uncomfortable for some of us to think about that. Essentially, next week is first week in November, right? We, we take the Lord's Supper the first week to remember. I remember his love. I'm aware of it. I think about his love for me. I think about what that meant here. And I am affected by his love for me. It does something in me. It, it fuels my relating to other people. Okay? So I'm going to describe how that does. Thinking about it, being aware of it. <clears throat> there's, a, there's a little word. It's actually in our text. I'll get to a little bit later on today, but I'm jumping ahead. It's a little word that is used a number of times in the scripture, and it all comes from, he's exhorting us to do something, but it comes from thinking about what Jesus has done and, and being affected by it. It's a little word. The word is shorter than the word the. It starts with the word a, it ends in the word, letter, not word, s. It's the word as. Would you think about the word as? We are to forgive others like we want to be forgiven. No, we are to forgive others as we've been forgiven. We are to love others like they want to be forgiven, right? No, we are to love others as we've been loved by Christ, as. As means, I'm remembering how he loved me. I'm remembering how he forgave me. You will never love another person. You will never forgive another person because they deserve it, because they've earned it, because they're so lovable. You won't treat your spouse like that. You won't forgive your spouse like that. You won't forgive your coworker because of that. No, no. It comes from us remembering how we've been loved, how we've been forgiven. And as we receive, as we think about that, we're affected. That's life in him. That's what it means to abide in him. He's not describing religion. He's not describing a hobby. He's not describing going to church. He's describing a real life in him, a real way we are affected. He wants to live in us. He wants to be in us like that. He wants what comes out to be so odd to the world that we would love or we would forgive or we'd serve others like that. It's odd. It should stand out. It doesn't come because I'm trying to do these things so they notice God. No, it comes because I'm thinking really about what he's done for me. I'm affected by it. 
then it really comes out of you. If you do it because you're trying to win someone over, it's just a duty. It might be the right thing, but it's just a duty. He wants it to be in us. This is life in Him. This is why this gospel is written. Every single one of us needs this gospel. I need this gospel. I needed it this week. I needed it yesterday. I'm going to need it tomorrow and today. Think about this. So whatever it means to abide in Him, to being connected to Him, to developing an awareness to that, it's remembering. It's thinking about His Word. It's thinking about His love for me and being affected by it. Abide in His love. These disciples think of where this was when He spoke it. Two very powerful events One which they've just witnessed, another one they will. Love others as I I have loved you. It's the same conversation, probably the same room where he's just washed their feet. He is stripped down into a menial servant doing what a menial servant would do. They had animal dirt on their feet from the streets in Jerusalem at that time of year. It was filled. He humbled himself to wash their feet, loved them like that, to teach them what was going to happen when he went to the cross, which is hours away, laying down his life. Love others as though I've loved you. They were profoundly affected by it. These men were. And we're to remember it and receive those particular words. So, I think what I tried to unpack there is what it means to abide in him. It's not exhaustive, but part of it is having his word abide in us and abiding in his love. And I try to be specific in how that, that is, okay? I, if there's a summary word in the Bible of his relationship with us and our relationship to others, and you'll see this in, um, in Romans, Galatians, it's other letters that say this. The summary word is, is love. It's a love that's unlike what what we understand. So I'll get there in just a moment. So explaining abiding. When we abide in Christ, you kind of go, what's the fruit? What's the fruit? He says fruit. Is fruit, is it fruit of the Spirit? I would say this, when we abide in Christ, we will bear the fruit of loving obedience. That's the word I want to use. That's a phrase. It's obedience. It's keeping his commandments. And it's abiding. It's a loving obedience. There's a heart that comes out. And I'm going to... Lord, help me. I'm I'm trying to explain this in a way um, that captures us. It's consistent with the text here. There's a couple of things he repeats. So I don't have this up here, but in verses 10 and 14, he basically says that love is expressed by keeping his commands. So he said that before. We've talked about that in previous messages. And he says, secondly, this love others as I have loved you. Okay? So I'm going to, um, let me read verses 12 and 13 again. This is my commandment that you love one another. There's the word as. In my Bible, it's circled. As I've loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lays down his life for his friends. So what Jesus is doing is calling us to love others like he's loved us. Probably few of us will ever actually literally have the opportunity to lay our lives down. Okay? That's probably won't happen for us. Now it happens in other parts of the world regularly. Yet here we daily have opportunities to love others by laying down our life that is giving up our personal rights, serving others, and treating them actually as more important than us. That would be Philippians 2. Treating someone else as more important than us. So I'm going to give you some examples of loving others like Jesus, laying down your life. And I would also say, I see this in you. I, I've, I've experienced this in you. So here's one. You cancel your plans to be with someone in need. <laughs> Many times. You take someone to your home for a night or for a season. You give a little more than you thought you could. A little more of your time. A little more of your energy. A little more of your money. While you're trusting God to take care of your needs too, because you, you got needs. You gave a little more than you thought you could. But God enabled you to do so. More of your time. More of your energy. More of your money. You laid down your life, you loved others by by taking time to listen to another person. You took an interest by asking questions, even praying for them. When at the same time, you have needs too, but you listened to them. 
You didn't go, oh yeah, me too. No, you listened. You were present. You cared. Parents of small kids, tired, worn out. You laid down your life when you chose to be patient with your spouse and you had no energy. You both had been giving out and you, you loved them that way. Just examples of loving others like Christ loves us. I, I see those kinds of things in you. So I'm going to end this way. I'm going to end with um, looking at the promises of an abiding life and a warning about an unconnected life. So here's the promises. So I'm not taking these like in, as you can tell, I'm picking out different things along the way. Um, Look at verse 7. I'm going to read it again. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. So when you abide in Christ, this is one of his promises, you can ask anything of God. Um, I didn't give you the verse to project. Did you, do you have it? No, okay, I'm going to read it again. I want, how many people have memorized this verse or heard it before? Okay, we hear it a particular way and I want to change how we hear it I, I, because I think the text does that, okay? <clears throat> if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and will be done for you. Here's how most of us hear that condition. If I do this, then God will do that. Okay? That's what we hear. We never say it like this, but it's like, how do we get God to answer my prayers? Well, if I do this. He does say if in there. That's not how this is written. So I would say actually, this is one of the, I don't know, dangers, is that right word to use? Weaknesses of memorizing scripture and memorizing just one verse as opposed to a context. That verse is true, but he says it within a context. What is the context? He's talking about abiding in him like this. This way in which we relate to him. This is, this is a love relationship that he speaks of. Do I have that thing in here? Yeah, okay. It, this is a love relationship. So I think of it as, if I do this, then God will do that. Then I'm thinking like a child. That's how I'm understanding this. Jesus is saying it more this way in this love relationship. He says, when, when, oh, this is the part about if you keep his commandments, he says this. So he wants to say yes to his children. That's what he's saying. And when you abide in me and I in you, just like you want to please me when you're abiding in him, you want to please him. Then I want to say yes to you. If you're connected to me like a vine and branch, then you'll be asking for things that I want. It will be a joy to say yes to you. So last week we talked a little bit about marriage. I'm just trying to find different examples of this. So with Cindy, you know, so do I obey her? What happens in this relationship when there's something that she wants, okay, when the relationship's good, when I love her, I want to do what she wants, right? I want to please her. That's the, the language that this is used in. I want to please God. I'm abiding in him. I'm going to ask for the things he wants. Right, I'll use a different example. Um, a parent and a child. So think of a child and a parent. And um, should I tell this story or not? Okay. Use an example, no kids named. <clears throat> I was going to use a name. I don't know if we have. Stevie, turn off the TV. Ah, oh, Dad! Just five more minutes. What's Dad say? Turn off the TV now. Different example. Hey, Stevie, turn off the TV. Okay, Dad. Hey, Dad, program's almost over. Can I take five more minutes? How do you think dad responds the first time? How do you think he responds the second time? So we, is it a story we should tell our kids because we're what we're trying to teach is when, they, when the child obeys, when their spirit is submissive, when they want to do what the parent wants, what's the parent say? They want to say yes to their kid. Can I tell you how many times I said, yeah, finish the program. Dinner was ready. I'm telling when my, when my child says yes, is demonstrating an obedient, submissive, submissive spirit, I want to say yes. That's what God's saying in this, in this love relationship. It's not this condition. If you just do this, then God will just do this. That's, that's not how this is written. It's other relationship. When we abide in him, we want to please God. He's got our best in mind. And he wants to say yes to us. Does that make sense? We've, just, we've read it like this condition. 
It's what he wants to do. Okay, follow this. This is promises of abiding him. What does he call us in here that he doesn't call us? This is a trick, not a trick question. It's, this is in here. He calls us something that he doesn't use this phrase anywhere in John. Who said it? Thank you, Lord. He calls us friends. Do you think of God like that? You're my friends. Okay, let's read it again. This is, this is the second promise of abiding him to be a friend of the 14 and 15. I think he uses it three times. Uh, you're my friends if you do what I command you. No, oh, this is interesting. No longer do I call you servants for the servant doesn't know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. Think about this, okay? You're not my servants. That is, what's a servant? Servant's property. That's not a person. A servant has a function. You do something. That's not what he's saying. No, no, you're my friends. Some people don't have real friends. and In fact, their relationships more function in terms of what people can do for them. That's a little challenging to understand. And some even, you know, they do marriage that way and whatever. But friends actually genuinely enjoy each other. They love to be around each other. There's understanding. There's, there's trust here. They tell each other stuff. Look at, look at the phrase. 15. But I've called you friends for all that I've heard from my father. What's he say? I've told you. I tell you. That's what friends do. I'm, I'm telling you the very things my father is telling you. There's such huge relational overtones in this. He Loves to be with us. There are plenty of people that follow Jesus just for the popularity. That's not true friendship. He said, if you're my friend, you'll love me. You'll care about me. You'll care about what I care about. Ask. I'll share my life with you. I will tell you what the Father tells me. Isn't that cool? That's, that's part of the abiding life. Ask whatever you want when you're abiding in him. You're my friends. Here's the last one. Jesus' joy and our joy are joined together. Verse 11, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. What makes Jesus happy makes us happy. And true joy is beyond the circumstances. It's actually knowing that we're loved and accepted by him. And when you know that, it doesn't matter what else goes on. People insult you. They misunderstand you. Absolutely, absolutely going to happen. They did it to Jesus. They're going to do it to his people. When you're loved and accepted by him, you're okay. You get betrayed by somebody. It hurts, but you're okay. Because Jesus loves and accepts you, okay? I'm going back to identity. I'm going back to this kind of connection, this kind of awareness of him, this kind of receiving his love. This is the life he has for us. Friends, we will live differently when the world puts all their stock in who gets elected or whatever. I mean, we'll just live differently. Okay, last thing I want to say, I want to look at. So that was some promises of the abiding or connected life. One thing, the warning of the unconnected life. Trying to do life without Jesus. So I clipped one of these dudes off already. <clears throat> Trying to do life, Jesus. It's like uh, hoping this baby's going to produce some grape juice. It ain't happening. So now let me tell it in real life. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> I read this, actually I read this um, in a book called The Praying Life, Paul Miller, some years ago. And when I read this event, I thought, I've probably done that 20 times. He tells this story about uh, he, when he had teenage kids. And as I recall, one of the kids had... Um, so what I'm illustrating is doing life apart from God. Okay, that's what unconnected is. When I, when I try to do things and I don't even realize it's apart from him. So one of the kids had a, it was a, it was a project. It was like a computer thing that was going on. A, the computer, like something happened. It needed the backup disks. And he knew exactly where the backup disks were. I think he was helping his daughter, but his son had done something with the computer and did not put the backup disks back where they belonged. In fact, his son was known for not putting back things where they belonged. So he called up to his room, John, get down here. The disks weren't put back the last time you used them. So Don sulkily came down and rummaged at the disk and 
gave the disc to his dad, and he resolved the problem or whatever. John, you got to get better putting things back where they belong. Probably had that conversation 20 times. And then he says, how effective do you think that was on my son, John? How well do you think you responded? How much of the problem do you think it actually addressed or was helpful to him? It wasn't. So he talks about how the Lord convicted him. I'm reading the story crying because I'm like, oh, I've done that so many times with so many of my kids. Oh, Lord, help me. And then he goes on and tells, I think it's the same son, different thing, and he talks about a particular issue in his life. And he's, and he's oh, as he's developing this praying life and just abiding in God, the Lord just says to him, don't talk to him about it. I want you to pray about this. And he prays and prays and he describes how that goes on through a certain activity. About six months later, his teenage son comes up to him and says, hey dad, I got a problem I need your help with. It was the exact same area. Do you think his son listened then? Do you think there's a conversation then? Here's my problem. Here's our problem. I live disconnected from God too much. I know the problem. <laughs> I know who's got the discs. I know who didn't put them back. And I react and do the thing that seems the right thing to do. It's the thing that needs to be done right then. Ever done that? Yeah. So when emotions start going strong, that's a good time to put the, okay, Lord, ah, what's going on inside me right now? What should I do? And it may be taking a step out. But too often we respond in a way that might even seem good. We're not talking to God about it. God has more options than we can think of. I'm just illustrating a very normal way we live disconnected from him. Friends, there's no life in it. There's no life in it. You can do the right thing and there's no life in it. He wants us to walk with He really does. Do you believe he can change things? How hard would it be to take that thing and stop the thing in your spouse that you feel like needs to be addressed or in your friend and, and commit it to him in prayer and then ask him about it and keep asking him. Stay, abide in him and you can ask whatever you wish. I don't know how God will do it. I don't know. But let me confess this, that I too have been one. It's more easy for me to walk disconnected from him than joined to him. It's not what he intends. He offers, friends, much, much more to us. Sometimes we'll get pruned. Sometimes the outcome will not be what we wanted it to be. But he'll be faithful. I know that. He'll be faithful. And he'll produce in you what he intends, a steadfastness, a character that is, a character that is otherworldly. Then people might see him. And that's what we want. Let's together encourage, exhort, and walk with him like that. Let's pray. <sighs> Father, I pray that you would speak the things to our own hearts where we need it. Probably all of us are aware of areas where we have tried to do life without you. Thank you that you are patient with us, that you are kind, that your word is alive and instructive. So God, we invite this again. Would you accomplish the very things in us, things that we don't even see, for your glory and our good. Amen. Here we're going to close singing. They're going to pass an offering bag. Um, would love for you this way. And there's a connect card that you have. I think Mike said this earlier. But if you have